After 12 long years, Dragon's Dogma 2 is finally out, and, well, you read the title. I'm sure you've seen the massive amount of outrage against this game for lacking basic features, the microtransactions, terrible performance issues, the obnoxious diversity and general ugliness of the NPCs. For the most part, these complaints are completely justified. Now, would I say I'm disappointed? Believe it or not, not really. Maybe because I'm just so used to disappointment at this point, but I think my expectations were pretty tempered leading up to release. Yes, back in January, I was still pretty excited, but as little bits of news leaked out and people began to comb over the footage, there were a lot of suspicions that something wasn't quite right with this game. And as usual, those people were absolutely correct. So the game we're left with is not even really a sequel, but truly a remake to Dragon's Dogma. And in the nature of most modern remakes, it's not an upgrade over the original. That doesn't mean it's a bad game, I still had a lot of fun with it. The combat system is still way more fun to me than any Souls game. But it's undeniable that this game is just as flawed, if not more flawed, than the original. My biggest problem with the sequel is that it doesn't improve upon the elements that people loved about the first game. Dragon's Dogma was always a extremely flawed game. If I had actually managed to finish my retrospective in time, you would have seen that the combat was amazing, but almost everything else about the game was complete shit. And so to save you a whole lot of time if you don't want to listen to this whole review, let me just tell you the reason why this sequel is inferior to the original without a doubt is because there is no Bitter Black Isle. There's no true end game. There's not even a post game dungeon like the Everfall in the original where you could fight boss monsters whenever you wanted to without having to walk across giant empty landscapes or waste precious fairy stones teleporting around. Now, the new post-game experience in this, while very cool looking, functionally, is kind of just meh. And so without that, it feels like a truly incomplete experience for a different reason than the original game was incomplete. And look, I realize I'm coming across super negative in the intro here. I really do love the gameplay experience, at least the combat anyway. But I have to be honest with you, just like the original game, this is not going to appeal to most people. This is truly a game made for gamers like me who value the core gameplay loop of a video game over anything else. And so while yes, the game isn't exactly everything I wanted it to be, I still really had fun with this game. There's so many clips from the stream where I'm clearly smiling or my mouth is gaping in awe because something fucking cool just happened. I haven't felt this mixed on a game in years, as you'll soon see. But without further ado, here's why Dragon's Dogma 2 is a massive waste of potential. Normally I would start off by talking about the gameplay, but I think I need to address the various controversies first. I think without a doubt the most baffling choice, like I said in the intro, is the decision to not have a new game feature. Now of course, at the time of me recording this, they just patched the game, adding in a new game feature. But it's obvious that this game was rushed out. There's a lot of unfinished elements of this, just like the first game had a lot of unfinished elements. But my point is, I totally understand the outrage against this. For the second biggest problem, we have performance issues. This game runs like absolute shit in cities. Why is that? Well, because of the NPC density. And from what I understand, this is not very well optimized. And so this is putting a massive burden on people's CPUs, and even my rig, which has a Ryzen 9 5900X, the performance would tank completely whenever I fast traveled to Vernworth, the capital city. And this same problem applies to any town in the game, though to a lesser extent. Yet more evidence this game was rushed out. Now for the third biggest problem, we have the wokeness. This game has definitely suffered under ESG. There is a comical amount of diversity here, and I'm not talking about the cats. There are several prominent black characters that, unlike the first game with Mason, who is actually a good character, 
There is no explanation where these Africans came from. They're just all here in every single town. I've been noticing this from every single high budget game that's released over the past few years. If that doesn't tell you that it's related to ESG, I don't know what will. The good news is this doesn't really seem to apply to the writing. All these black characters are pretty much treated like any other character. You could argue it's woke that Sigurd invented the mystic spear hand vocation, when clearly there's a statue in the public square of Vernworth of a guy with a double-bladed spear decapitating a dragon, which is obviously much older than he is. But I guess you could argue that he came up with, like, the magic part of the class, but still definitely felt like a special snowflake character. And I am just now learning that apparently NPCs don't permanently die in this game. I thought they did until very recently, and so I was going to, in a very edgy fashion, tell you to simply dispose of the diversity problem if you don't like it. But no, apparently NPCs just respawn after a certain amount of time, which is how it worked in the first game. So yes, for those of you amongst my audience who are particularly sensitive to left-wing propaganda, you're gonna notice a bit of it in this game. It's certainly not as bad as some other modern games, but it's still definitely there. Now we get to the fourth biggest problem, the microtransactions. Some of you might be shocked that it's this low on the list. But yeah, this was completely and utterly overblown. Some people have actually called me a shill, just for pointing out that the microtransactions in this game are no worse than what Capcom has put in its last several single player games. Are the microtransactions still bad? Of course, otherwise I wouldn't have bothered putting them in this list. But there was a lot of misinformation being spread around about these. First of all, you can obtain almost all of these in game, relatively cheaply. The character editor was probably the biggest one people were bitching about, when it only costs 500 rift crystals in-game to get it. And yeah, it's a one-time use item, so you would have to spend it again if you want to recreate your character main pawn, but you also could just beat the game. In New Game Plus, you can edit your main character and main pawn for free. A lot of these other ones would just blatantly be a waste of money if you purchase them, like the camping kit. The only benefit it has is that it's lighter than a normal one. And the harpy lore item? What the fuck is even the point of that? The heartfelt pendant just increases affinity with whatever character you give it to. The jail key is basically completely pointless. You're probably never gonna get arrested, you can just outrun the guards. You can buy Rift Crystals, which once again seems like a waste because they're not good for purchasing that much. But another one that was a point of contention is the five Wake Stones you can buy. These are items that bring you back to life when you die. And yeah, it's a scumbag move to sell extra lives for money. That's something you would see in a mobile game. But Dragon's Dogma is already a pretty easy game. The original was only challenging in the very beginning before you were properly equipped and leveled and had good skills, and the difficulty dropped off super hard past like the 10 hour mark. It became brain dead easy until you got to Bitter Black Isle. In the sequel, the average combat is a bit more challenging on average, but the game gives you so many more wake stones. So yes, buying five is kind of cheating, but again, if you're playing Dragon's Dogma for a Souls-like experience, sorry, you bought the wrong game. Now, honestly, if you ask me, the two worst microtransactions here are the old soundtrack and sound effects set, because there's no way to get this in-game, and this is something a lot of people probably want. In fact, I'm considering buying it. So that's a pretty scumbag move. And two, the extra port crystal. Now, there was a bit of misinformation spread around this as well. Some idiots tried to say that they were locking fast travel behind a microtransaction. Again, doing no research at all, just spreading lies to doom post about this game. But it's still a scumbag move because this is a placeable fast travel point in a game where you're going to do a hell of a lot of walking. But just like most of these other microtransactions, you can get port crystals in-game. But they are very rare. Unless you use a guide, you're probably only going to find three or four in your first playthrough. 
So yes, those two microtransactions are pretty bad. The others, people are just exaggerating over. I mean, just take a look at Resident Evil 4 Remake, which I talked about in my video, by the way. Let's see, we've got exclusive weapons that you can't get in-game. There's weapon exclusive upgrade tickets. This is just straight up paid to win, by the way. That's getting the final upgrade for your guns before you've gotten any of the other upgrades. There's charms for the attache case, which will no doubt make the game easier. There's the original soundtrack swap, just like this game and just like the other Resident Evil remakes as well. And of course, exclusive costumes and filters. You cannot tell me with a straight face that Dragon's Dogma 2's microtransactions are worse than this. And my point is, not one of you fuckers bitched about Resident Evil 4 Remake's microtransactions, but you're having a hissy fit over Dragon's Dogma 2's. Dragon's Dogma 2 has a hell of a lot of problems, okay? Some big problems that are actually wrong with the game. But you can't think for yourself, you have to be told what to be angry about. And so you got angry about microtransactions that are actually less bad than Capcom's other big games. So all I'm asking is that you either one, have some consistent beliefs, or two, admit that you fell for the outrage psyop. Okay, I think that just about covers all the controversy. There's plenty of other problems with this game, but we'll get to those in their respective sections. Now onto the gameplay. If you've ever played Dragon's Dogma 1, or at least watched one of my streams, you probably already know the only reason to ever play the first game is because the gameplay was super fun. Not necessarily challenging, or complex, or have a super high skill ceiling, but the game just felt really good to play. It clicked perfectly, it had such a simple system, yet so satisfying. And I have to say, while the sequel isn't quite as good, it's still pretty fun. Just starting off with the basic mechanics across each vocation, you've got access to a light attack, a heavy attack on the melee classes, four skills that you can equip from a decent size pool, and a special vocation ability on R1. This is noticeably different from the first game, where you had access to six skills on every single class except Warrior. And yeah, I'm not gonna try and sugarcoat this, it's definitely a downgrade. While most classes never really needed all six skills, the fact that we're now limited to just one weapon per class severely reduces the versatility of the ranged classes. You're especially going to feel the reduced skills on Mage and Sorcerer. Despite this being a baffling decision on the surface, I think there was a real purpose behind this. I don't agree with it, but I think the logic here by the game designers is that you shouldn't have access to every skill that you could possibly need in every situation. Because now, at the various campfires spread across the map, you can quickly change between any of the skills you've unlocked for that vocation. That said, how often are you going to realistically do this? I only used it once or twice. You're not really gonna feel it on Fighter, because let's be honest, the shield skills were pretty bad in the original game. But now every class that used to be a dagger class no longer has a melee option. Archer and Magic Archer feel severely gimped in this game. And to bring up some fairly unique mechanics to Dragon's Dogma, you can pick up and throw small enemies if you knock them off balance. I love that, even if it's not always the most effective tactic. Being able to pick up a goblin and just throw it off a cliff is great. There's very few games you can do that. And of course, one of the main appeals of this game, being able to climb giant monsters and stab them in the face. That was the very reason I fell in love with the original, and it still feels pretty good in this game, even if it's a bit slower. Now that doesn't necessarily mean it's a downgrade, because now you can actually straight up stand on top of monsters as if they were a platform to regain your stamina, which is a great thing. In the original game, climbing as a warrior was basically pointless when you could just spam jumping a light attack. Now I can stand on top of their back and smash their head with Indomitable Lash, which is just awesome. So climbing has definitely been improved over the original. Another improvement to the basic mechanics is how they changed the heavy attack. On melee classes, it now acts as a finisher, giving you a follow-up attack that does massive damage if the enemy is surprised or on the ground. 
And on Mage and Sorcerer, the heavy attack is actually changed to a special spell you always have equipped. For Mage, it gives you Anodyne, the healing spell, at all times, which is an awesome change because you are always going to have a healing spell equipped on Mage. And for Sorcerer, it gives you a spell that restores your stamina which is incredibly useful because you're constantly depleting stamina with the built-in class skill that lets you quicken spells for the cost of more stamina. The only questionable usage is for the Magic Archer, where Triangle just lets you change the size of your lock-on radius and let you target more enemies at the same time instead of just one. I pretty much never use the wide shot. I feel like the focus shot is just more useful for this combat system. Another good change is the tweak to the healing system. In the original game, healing was straight up broken, and I'm not talking about spells. Healing spells were actually useless because you could pause the combat any time and just consume all your healing at the same time. Now, you can actually still do that in this game, but to dissuade constantly pausing, there's also a quick menu to use a healing or stamina restorative without having to pause, which was definitely another good move. In the original, healing spells couldn't heal you up to your full maximum health. Only food could, meaning there was no reason to ever have a mage in your party past the early game. Now in this game, when your maximum health is reduced from taking consistent damage, the only way to get that healing back is to either rest at an inn or a campsite. Now this might sound annoying, but in practice it's really not. There's campsites pretty much everywhere. And if you can't find one, then it makes combat that much more tense when you're down to half your maximum or less. Now, of course, this is kind of ruined by the fact that the game gives you a lot more wake stones, which are the revive items, because once you're brought back to life, you get your maximum health back. But still, it was a step in the right direction. Another thing you're going to notice probably almost immediately is that the animations are much more sluggish and realistic in this game. This is something I also talked about in my Resident Evil 4 remake review. It could just be a problem with the RE engine, but in Dragon's Dogma 1, which was made in the MT Frameworks engine, the movement was instant, incredibly responsive and precise. Yes, the animations didn't look realistic at all, but the game was very fast-paced, hack and slash. It was kind of like a anime action RPG. Now animations are much slower, more weighty, and you can even get stunned for several seconds after getting hit. In fact, there's multiple ways to get stunned or slowed in this game, and it can be incredibly annoying combined with how much easier basic enemies can stagger you in this compared to the first. And that's something I'll go into a little bit more later, but let's just say I'm not entirely a fan of these more realistic animations. Dragon's Dogma is not the least bit realistic, and yet they took out some of the f more over-the-top anime features like the double jump. Yeah, there's no double jump. As someone who's put hundreds and hundreds of hours into the first game, I gotta say I'm not a huge fan of this new combat style. It's just a little bit too slow. I like the hyper-aggressive style in the original game. Now, it's not completely dead. As I get into the vocation breakdown, you'll see there's at least one class that can still go hyper-aggressive. And speaking of which, yeah, let's just get into the meat of the gameplay, the 10, or really 9.5, vocations in this game. So let's just start off with Fighter. Fighter's incredibly basic. It actually feels a little bit better than the original game, if you ask me. I was never a fan of Fighter in the first game just because it severely lacked damage and blocking was only questionably useful next to the dodge roll every single dagger class had access to. Now that only Thief has a dodge, Fighter has unique utility as the most effective defense class. Or at least it would be if it wasn't for Mystic Spearhand, but we'll get to that in a sec. Not only can you block and parry basically any attack, you have access to a lot of the same skills the original game had, like charging forward with your sword, you have an evasive counter, there's a shield bash that can knock small enemies off their feet and off the cliff, which is always fun. And the ultimate skill is a barrage of rapid fire slashes that does quite a bit of damage. Now, it's certainly nothing close to the best DPS you can achieve in this game, but DD2 is easy enough that it really doesn't make that much of a difference. If you like the sword and board play style, I think Fighter is a solid choice. 
Next up, we've got Archer, which is probably the most gimped class in the game. Since Strider got split into two vocations, that being Archer and Thief, the Archer half is just kind of boring. Doesn't mean it's bad, it does decent damage. But without any useful melee skills, you're basically just standing in the back and shooting arrows over and over again. All of the skills are some version of shooting arrows. They even made it so explosive and tar arrows and all the other types are locked to a skill. You can't just equip blast arrows and shoot them anymore, no. It's a fucking skill. And to add insult to injury, the ultimate skill is an arrow that takes all of your stamina to fire, and the damage isn't even that fucking good. For something that makes you completely immobile for several seconds, it might take out one health bar on a boss. Maybe. But the worst part of the class is, it doesn't have an evasive move. There's no way to dodge attacks. So if your tank pawns go down or you run too far ahead of the rest of the party, you're just gonna get stun locked by basic ass goblins or skeletons or saurians. I don't know what the fuck Itsuno was thinking with this one, but Archer is just boring and will no doubt be incredibly frustrating if any hard content is ever released for this game. Next up, we have the best class in the game, Thief, and it's not close. This is the same problem the first game had, but damage is king, and Thief does the most damage by a considerable margin. The Skull Splitter skill, which was also OP in the first game, allows you to spin like a saw blade, hitting an enemy dozens of times in one attack. Not to mention you jump in the air to use it, so it's probably going to hit the weak spot of most bosses. On top of this, Thief also has a skill very similar to Dire Gouge from the Assassin, where you stab a monster in the face for massive damage and then leap off. If that wasn't enough, Thief also has access to a counterattack, Cutting Wind, which allows you to zip across the battlefield faster than any other class. Like I said, a dodge on R1 with invincibility frames, and perhaps worst of all, the ultimate skill is a buff that lets you automatically dodge all attacks. The only cost is a slow drain of your stamina, and I mean slow, dude. There was a point in this game where both of my pawns were dead. It was just me versus like 15 goblins, and I single-handedly killed them all just by auto-dodging all of their moves. It's insane. The funny thing is, I didn't even name all of Thief's useful skills. You can buff your daggers with fire. The other ultimate skill, which is supposed to be a joke skill, you blow yourself up and buff with even stronger fire. There's a skill that lets you pull harpies out of the sky, which is great because harpies are annoying as fuck in this game. Thief is basically playing this game on journalist mode. You don't even have to look at the screen to win. The final basic vocation is Mage, and it's the Heal Slut class. You really shouldn't play this, it's clearly meant for pawns. Doesn't mean it's not good, it's actually much better than it was in the first. In fact, I would say it's essential to have one of your pawns be a mage in this one. But it is incredibly boring, your offensive spells are just not that good compared to Sorcerer. But on the other hand, it has access to buffs that Sorcerer no longer has, like the elemental buffs for your weapons. Now notably, there's no light or dark buff in this game, I thought that's kind of weird, because light elemental damage still exists, it's just not a buff. But whatever, I guess that's just a nitpick. The two strongest skills are no doubt the one that can instantly heal you up to your current maximum health, and one that gives you a magical shield that blocks any three attacks. That one is incredibly useful. Unfortunately, sometimes your pawns are too stupid to cast at every battle. There's really no reason not to. The ultimate skill, on the other hand, is not that great. It hastens all of your allies and increases their stamina recovery, but at the end of the duration, it drains all of your stamina and knocks you off of your feet. That is just way too heavy a cost. Mage also has a few other situationally good skills, but between the max heal and the shield, it more than justifies a place in your party. Now for the two advanced vocations. Yes, you heard me right, there's only two. First up is Warrior, and I've heard a lot of mixed reception to this class. 
and even I felt a little bit mixed on it, as much like the first game, it's super useful and fun in the early game, but its effectiveness starts to drop off near the end. But after min-maxing my gear and putting some more time into it, I still gotta say, this is definitely an upgrade from the first. For those of you who don't remember or have never played the first game, the end game optimal play style for Warrior was jumping and hitting light attack. That was pretty much all you did because it was your fastest attack by far. You could also turn around 180 degrees and knocked you a little bit higher into the air. It was very effective at hitting enemy weak spots and did decent damage. And if you combined it with the Strider Augment that increases the damage of jumping attacks, it was by far your most effective way of hurting the enemy. The thing is, that's super fucking boring. I mean, yeah, it did have some access to some other pretty cool skills. I still think Arc of Might is one of the coolest attacks in any action RPG. You basically just charge up a move for like 10 seconds and then slam the boss as hard as you fucking can. And it could actually knock smaller bosses flying through the air, sometimes into the void for a very satisfying kill. But Warrior in the first game had a very simple problem, and that was the lack of pretty much any defensive options. You had one skill that had invincibility frames. And unlike every other class in DD1, it only had access to three skills. So how has that been fixed in DD2? Well, first of all, you have four skills, just like every other class now. Second of all, you have a lot more super armor. So while you're charging attacks or swinging, it takes a lot of damage for the enemy to stagger you past your poise. And this is incredibly effective against bosses. Not to mention you can now shoulder bash in between your attacks, which is functionally very similar to the pommel bash move from the first. Or if you played Great Sword and Monster Hunter, it's very similar in playstyle to that. And man, it's just really satisfying to uppercut a boss and knock him on his ass. It's some of the most fun you can have in this game. The only problem Warrior has is, ironically, crowds of weaker enemies. For some reason, the way the super armor works, it's actually weaker to consecutive weak attacks than one strong attack. And so a group of hobgoblins can stagger you out of charging an attack and then proceed to beat the shit out of you on the ground. It is absolutely infuriating, especially in the post-game section, where harpies can actually grab you out of charging a move or pick you up and throw you. The skeleton wizards can freeze you or stun you with lightning. It got to the point where it actually wasn't even fun to play anymore. But with the help of a chat member and looking up a couple things online, there's a unique forge system in this game where each region of the map has a different way of upgrading equipment. Well, the dwarven forge you unlock from the magic archer quest increases your knockdown resistance on your armor and makes your weapons deal more staggered damage, which is perfect for warrior. So it's a lot more fun once your equipment has been properly upgraded. But, of course, the problem with this is that no other class has to do this to be effective. Warrior just doesn't do enough damage, and its ultimate skill is Arc of Might from the first game, but for some fucking reason, stupid ass reason, it takes all of your stamina to use. And no, the damage is not in any way worth it. So you win some, you lose some. Warrior feels a lot better to play. It's just a very unique play style that is suited to the boss mechanics in this game. Knocking bosses on their ass is still fun as hell. And for better or worse, there's no spammable quick attack that you can use over and over again. So you can actually have fun and be optimal at the same time. For the other advanced vocation, we have Sorcerer. A lot of people are upset with what they did to this class. And yeah, I'm not exactly happy about it either. The fact that you're stuck to just four skill slots on a class that has access to at least seven good moves. This is just unacceptable. Not to mention, Sorcerer has fewer skills than the first game. I think most of the other vocations, it's fairly comparable. But with Sorcerer, they actually removed several spells including the ability to enchant your ally's weapons. He can't do that anymore. All of his spells are attack-oriented, more or less. 
Now, on the upside, like I mentioned at the beginning of this section, he can now quicken spells on R1, which consumes additional stamina to make you cast spells twice as fast. Oh, and we can't forget on Triangle, you can restore your stamina, which totally makes up for all of the additional stamina cost from quickening a spell. And although you have no evasive or defensive skill, the Thundermine spell can act as basically a shield to protect yourself. Like it sounds, it's an electric mine that you throw in front of yourself and it shocks any nearby enemies. This is incredibly good against crowds of fodder. They can't even touch you while the mine is up. So unfortunately, just like the first, it does create this very automated play style where you do the same exact thing every battle. You throw up the Thundermine, and then you cast one of your most powerful spells immediately afterward. Like Thief, Sorcerer has two ultimate skills, that being Maelstrom, the giant tornado move from the first, and Meteor, which was also in the first. And Meteor might just be the best skill in the entire game. Unlike the first game, every single meteor hits on target and it does insane damage. One cast of the spell can take out like three to four health bars. I will say this, there is an additional reason to play as mage or sorcerer even if you don't like the playstyle, and that's the ability to levitate. Mage and sorcerer now have the only additional jump move in the game, double jump doesn't exist on any vocation. Levitate is incredibly useful for getting the Seeker's tokens spread across the map. Yes, I would say Sorcerer is still kind of a downgrade, especially because there's almost nothing new to the class. There's one new ultimate skill, Prescient Flare, which attaches like a mine to an enemy and then you just shoot it to blow it up. But I feel like Meteor is just better and you only have four skill slots, so you're probably not even going to use it once you get the ultimate skills. Now onto the hybrid vocations. Let's start off with Mystic Spearhand, the replacement for Mystic Knight. Now on paper, this class sounds super cool. You're basically playing as Darth Maul. You have a double-bladed spear. You can paralyze enemies with lightning, teleport across the arena, set up an invincible shield over yourself and your party members for several seconds, and of course, telekinesis to throw small enemies off of cliffs. All of those things are cool tools, there's only one problem. The class does mediocre damage. Now it's probably a good thing that the class had one weakness, but unfortunately it's a pretty fucking big weakness in this game. Because you have access to an invincibility shield, it's not like you can ever lose. This is another class that's kind of brain dead in its gameplay if you're really cheesy about the shield. But you also can't really win in a timely manner either. It has one high damage skill, which requires about half of your stamina or more to cast, but it shoots this huge magic blast. And it looks very cool, but I still don't think it's all that practical. The damage trade-off for the stamina is still really not that good compared to other classes. And this is kind of a nebulous complaint, but I still felt like there's something missing from this class. I'm not sure what exactly, but I don't think the gameplay style completely clicked for me. And yeah, I'm gonna be honest with you, I preferred Mystic Knight. I was a big fan of Mystic Knight in the original. It was the ultimate tank class. You set up your orb, you set up your field around the orb, and then you counter enemy attacks to shoot a million homing magic orbs. And yeah, okay, that's pretty much all you did every single fight, but taking out five health bars in five seconds will always be satisfying. Mystic Knight was just an insane DPS on top of having insane defense. Mystic Spearhand, while playing completely uniquely, is not as fun as it could be, but I still kind of like the class. Next up is another returning class, Magic Archer. The class is exactly what it sounds like. It's a magic version of Archer, where you have homing elemental arrows. And just like Archer, it has no defensive option whatsoever. So you're going to be staying in the back of the party, letting your pawns tank stuff while you just blink at enemies with ice arrows, a guided fire arrow, lightning arrows that bounce off all the walls. One of the cool new skills lets you hurl a giant chunk of ice at an enemy to stagger them. That one's just kind of fun, even if it's not always the most practical. And of course, the ultimate skill, trading in some of your maximum health for absolutely absurd damage. 
I mean, all it takes is about a quarter of your health bar to take out 80% of Grigori's health when he's downed. The final boss of the game got nearly one shot by this skill. Now, of course, unlike Meteor, it actually has a significant cost, but there's nothing stopping you from simply resting at a campsite after the battle is over. So my issue with the Magic Archer class is very similar to Archer. The gameplay style is just not really that interesting or fun to me. It's certainly effective, but it's just too simplistic. There's a reason why in the original game, both Ranger and Magic Archer had access to daggers, because otherwise the game just becomes a glorified third-person shooter, and not a good one. So while I certainly don't hate the class now, it obviously feels like it's missing something. And onto the penultimate class, we have Trickster. I fucking hate this class. Why did they put it in the game? It doesn't even make sense why it exists. It doesn't fit the playstyle of Dragon's Dogma at all. Okay, to explain what it does very briefly, you can summon a simulacrum of yourself and use magical hallucinogens to make enemies attack the simulacrum instead of you or your pawns. Okay, sounds pretty good so far, except you do no damage. No damage at all. In Dragon's fucking Dogma, a game infamous, how basically every class in the game could do absurd damage under the right circumstances. It was a casual game where you just fucking demolish the shit out of giant monsters. That was the whole appeal. And so you made a class that can't fucking do damage. Are you out of your goddamn mind? I mean, sure, you get a skill that makes your pawns more aggressive and do more damage. Oh, wow. The reason I play Dragon's Dogma is totally to watch my pawns fight for me. Are you kidding? This class sucks. I'm not talking about it anymore. And so for the final class, it's not even really a class. We have Warfarer. Put very simply, this is a create a class. This class almost feels like an apology to the fans of the first for being limited to just one weapon per vocation. And so you can make an extremely stunted version of Strider by combining thief and archer skills and so on and so forth. There's only one problem, and it's the fact that the rearmament skill, the thing that lets you switch weapons, takes up a skill slot, so you only get three. That is so absurdly stupid and not well thought out on any level that it's baffling. Having only three skill slots between the other nine vocations makes the entire concept of this class virtually useless. Not to mention, you can't use any of the ultimate skills from the other classes. Now for most classes, they're really not that great. But I would have loved to use Thief's overpowered buff on any other class. That would have been awesome. But no, we can't do that, and so the next best thing is to use Mystic Spearhand's shield combined with any other class. At least that's what I figured, right? I did it with Warrior, but honestly, probably the most effective way of using this would be to combine it with either Archer or Magic Archer, because then you have an invincibility shield, since the only thing those classes were lacking was some form of defense, right? Now, does that make for an interesting playstyle? Debatably, because then at the very least you have a melee weapon along with your ranged weapon, but I would argue it's still kind of boring. It really needed that fourth skill slot. In fact, I would argue it needed six, like the original game. Then it would be an awesome class. It feels like Warfarer only exists just so that Itsuno and Capcom could say this game has more vocations than the first. So yeah, kind of a disappointment. So that's all 10 vocations. I gotta say, I don't really think it's a downgrade over the first so much as it is boring that it's almost exactly the same as the first. This is something I'll probably say five more times over the course of this review, but this doesn't feel like a sequel. It feels like a remake of the first game. I still think this is a solid class selection that actually offers unique play styles across them, unlike the first game, where all four of the classes that could use daggers played very similarly. But at the same time, at least two or three of the classes in here aren't even fun to play. That is a serious issue. But it's not the biggest issue with the gameplay. Let's get in to the enemies, right? As harsh as I have been on Souls games, specifically Elden Ring, I was very critical of it, even though I still gave it Game of the Year. 
From Software blows other companies out of the water when it comes to enemy variety. It is clearly internally at the company a priority when they develop games, and I love that. Enemy variety is incredibly important to a fun combat experience, especially given the limited mechanics of Souls Combat. And to compare Dragon's Dogma 2 to another game made by the same company, I love Monster Hunter, not just because it has complex mechanics that require a lot of skill, but also the sheer variety in monsters there is to fight. The base release of Monster Hunter World only had like 20 enemies. That was a major complaint from fans. But years and years later, Iceborne has more than twice that now. And Monster Hunter Rise, I think, has even more than World. And so that is a huge part of why those games feel so replayable. If you get bored of hunting one monster, you just hunt another one. And so where am I going with this? Well, I'm sure you've heard the very common complaint of this game, that the enemy variety is fucking awful. And it is. The basic enemy variety in this is nearly identical to the first game. You're going to be spending most of the game fighting goblins, bandits, Harpies, Saurians, Skeletons, Zombies. Yeah, all the same basic enemy types from the first game. The only new basic enemy type is a slime dude. Yes, fucking slimes. Dragon's Dogma is supposed to be heavily inspired by Dungeons and Dragons. All you have to do is take one look at Baldur's Gate 3 to know that there's way more creative and interesting enemy types in D&D than this. This is the most basic shit you could have come up with. And you're going to be spending at least 30 hours fighting these guys. I probably put in 50 plus hours into the game already. And I am definitely sick of fighting the same enemy types. Now, of course, it's not all bad. The enemy AI is definitely more complex and more interesting to fight. Maybe not quite Breath of the Wild level, where that game could sort of get away with the low enemy variety by having the enemy encounters be so varied, since there were a lot of interesting interactions between Link and the various Bokoblins and Lizalfos, etc., etc. But this game is a step in the right direction with that, where enemies will clearly exploit your weaknesses, they'll throw rocks at you, Harpies will pick you up and throw you off of cliffs, which is hilarious or infuriating depending on the circumstance. Fall damage is way more deadly than any monster in this game. Oh fuck! But unfortunately, this doesn't really apply to all the enemies. Fighting skeletons and zombies feels exactly the same as it does in the original. And a unique problem to this game that's not a problem in Zelda or DD1 for that matter is that the enemy density is off the fucking charts. There's an enemy encounter every 100 feet in this game, which makes the poor enemy variety that much more noticeable. And there's no way a patch can fix this, only a fucking DLC can, so it's kind of inexcusable. Now what about the boss monsters? This is the only reason why anybody should want to play Dragon's Dogma. I've said the same thing about the first about a hundred times. You're not playing it to fight goblins, you're playing it to fight the cyclopses, chimeras, and all the others. Well, I have to say, not counting Bitter Black Isle, this is actually a slight upgrade over the original game, but I do have to include Bitter Black Isle. The only version of Dragon's Dogma 1 you're going to be playing is Dark Arisen, right? And I'm now realizing I keep making reference to this thing called Bitter Black Isle, yet I've neglected to explain what it actually is throughout this video. Well, to explain it briefly, Bitter Black Isle is an endgame dungeon that was added in the re-release of Dragon's Dogma 1 called Dark Arisen. This is back in a time where you couldn't just simply purchase an expansion. No, sometimes you had to buy the game again just to get access to all the content. Now, in my case, I never owned the original version. I only ever played Dark Arisen. And Bitter Black Isle adds something that was sorely needed in the original version of the game, and that was challenging endgame content. The monsters there were incredibly deadly, could kill you in one or two hits. You could visit there from the beginning of the game, and so if you came there any time before you defeated Grigori, you had severely limited access to wake stones, meaning you couldn't just revive over and over again if you got killed. Bitter Black Isle was essentially five rooms copy-pasted across a huge dungeon in different configurations with randomly generated loot. That last part is very important. 
Even though I don't like loot games, the loot pool was pretty limited and the most important items you found, these unidentified pieces of gear you could find in chests, you could actually influence the loot you got based on the current vocation you had equipped on yourself and your main pawn. And so the randomness honestly wasn't all that bad. The loot itself was surprisingly well designed too. We're not just talking huge number boosts on the weapons, but the end game armor sets could have random passive abilities on them. There were new exclusive augments you could unlock, including one that made it much harder for a boss to shake you off while you're clinging to it, which is just blatantly overpowered. There were magic rings that amplified specific skills across all of the classes. Without naming any specific examples, just know that some upgraded skills were fucking awesome and just amplified that power fantasy experience that Dragon's Dogma was so good at delivering. On top of all of this, the first time you defeat Daemon, the final boss of the dungeon, the dungeon resets and all of the spawns become even more deadly. And to compensate for this, the loot gets even better. So while the end game wasn't super deep and you could probably get all the items you'd conceivably want in 20 hours or less, it still gave you a pretty satisfying end game if you wanted to grind out all of the best weapons and armor sets. Another great thing it added was two arenas in the dungeon that had a number of spawns of various bosses. And if you had an item called the Fiend Luring Incense in your inventory, it made the spawns even more powerful in these arenas, throwing multiple bosses at you at the same time. And so Bitter Black Isle felt like it was made for the fans. It's clear the devs who made it understood the appeal of Dragon's Dogma. Now that it's like 12 years later, it's obvious that most of those devs are long gone, but that's the reason why Bitter Black Isle was the best part of the game, if you were curious. And once again, just like the enemy variety, 80% of the bosses are the same ones from the first game. And even all of the new bosses aren't that good. Some of them feel unfinished. There's this giant fat snake boss you fight in the post game that is one of the easiest bosses in the game. It barely even attacks you. I swear it feels like the AI is bugged, because it only ever does like two moves. Another one is the Medusa. I missed out on fighting it in the first playthrough, and when I eventually found it in the second, it barely used any offensive moves. It mainly just tried to turn me to stone and just slithered around. Oh, and I can't forget to mention the Griffin's AI is just straight up bugged. Take a look at this. I know at least one of them has a fire spell. What the fu- Focus your attacks. A focused attack. Out of the four times I fought him in the first playthrough, three of those resulted in him drowning. And notably, there's no Hydra. One of the most memorable encounters from the first game is not in this one. And I have a lot to say about the new Grigori fight as well, but we're gonna save that for the story section. I will say, it's not all bad. I think the Doolahan enemy actually feels straight out of Bitter Black Isle. It's easily the most challenging boss. It's the only boss in the game that can actually actively drain your maximum health bar, so it's pretty dangerous. It's also highly resistant to physical attacks, so a lot of the vocations can't kill it very quickly, making the fight that much more interesting. And I can't forget about the new Minotaur enemies. They're actually pretty fun to fight and decently aggressive charging back and forth across the arena and falling over if they hit a wall. They're not particularly hard, but they are fun, and that's the important thing. It's actually difficult to explain why fighting giant monsters is so fun in Dragon's Dogma. Part of it is because you can climb on their back and stab them in the face like it's Shadow of the Colossus. Like I mentioned several times already, knocking them over with your insanely powerful moves is pretty cool. And unique to DD2, the ability to stand on their backs and wail on them with any class that's not particularly good at climbing. And as you've seen in the trailers, you can actually ride on a griffin as it flies back to its nest and then finish it off. Name another game where you can do that. 
Even the music played a great role in how good the combat felt. As you began to turn the tide of battle, the track Mortal Kombat would kick in. And everyone who played the first game remembers it. It's a perfect track for representing the heroes rising up and defeating the indomitable monster. Unfortunately, the arrangement in the sequel is not quite as good. They got rid of the electric guitar for some reason, but still it makes any fight more intense. Teaming up with your pawns to just lay into the enemy. I can't believe I haven't even talked about the pawns yet. Pawns are another element of this game that was actually upgraded. Infamously in DD1, pawns were completely brain dead and borderline useless with the exception of strider pawns with certain inclinations. On top of jumping off of cliffs or just getting hit by massive enemy attacks or doing no damage, Sorcerer pawns infamously never being able to finish casting a spell because they always think they're about to get hit by the enemy even if it would have whiffed they will cancel the spell and jump out of the way so 90% of the time they did nothing. There's an endless list of reasons why the pawn AI was terrible. In this game, pawns are still stupid. I have seen them just jump into the ocean and die instantly. However, they are noticeably more aggressive and will actually actively seek out and attack enemies. That's a big deal. It sounds like a basic thing, but it actually makes them useful in combat. Add on to this the fact that a mage will pretty consistently heal you and buff you with a shield that blocks attacks. Fighter and warrior pawns will actually try and draw aggro. At the very least, they know how to play their class to a basic degree. No, they're not as good as a player, but the game is not balanced around that. If this had co-op, you would beat every boss in like 30 seconds. The pawns do their job, they help, but you are the hero of the story. And so I can absolutely compliment this game on fixing a basically broken feature from the first. And that pretty much sums up the combat experience. This is probably the longest I've droned on about combat in like two years because people used to complain all the time I would drone on too much about details people didn't care about. But with Dragon's Dogma, the combat is everything. It's the only reason you should play the first game. It's that good. But everything else about the game was ass. And unfortunately, in DD2, it's pretty much the same situation. And so, just the fact that the combat is kind of a slight downgrade for the various reasons I went over, I think that's a really good argument that this game is inferior to the first. Before we talk about the story, I want to quickly cover some RPG mechanics. Dragon's Dogma was never particularly complex, but it did have a few interesting little quirks that some people love, some people hate. The biggest one is the stat growth on level up. In both the first and the second game, your stat growth is based on whatever vocation you're currently using, and this upset a lot of min-maxers because to have the most optimal stats, you were basically forced to play a specific class from level 11 all the way to 200. If you wanted to min-max attack, that was assassin, and if you wanted to do it for magic, that was sorcerer. I think the issue here is pretty obvious. You were forced to play as a class you didn't necessarily want to play for the vast majority of your play time. But I honestly never cared about this because Dragon's Dogma is a really easy game. I mean, sure, in the early to mid game, having a significantly higher damage stat for either strength or magic can make a massive difference in how long a fight takes. But by the time you got to the actually challenging content in Bitter Black Isle, the gear there had way higher stats than anything you could naturally achieve on your character. You could easily try out every single vocation over the course of your playthrough and be completely fine by the end game. This really only affects people who have that optimization autism. The munchkin type players, right? And I'm happy to tell you that this is even less of an issue in Dragon's Dogma 2. Even though your class still influences your stat gain, it seems to have a degree of randomness to it, or at the very least, any class now has a balanced growth in stats. There were multiple times where I leveled up as Warrior and didn't gain any attack or maybe only one or two points. So you might wonder what's even the point of keeping this stat growth system in the first place. Uh, I honestly don't have a good answer for that, but in DD2 they did add an additional system that is no doubt going to annoy min-maxers again. 
In New Game Plus, you can actually augment your vocation, but only one at a time, increasing its stat growth on level up. This means that if you're incredibly anal about min-maxing, you need to beat the game at as low a level as possible to get the max gain out of this new level up system. Now, at the same time, I still think this is incredibly pointless. DD2 is still a pretty fucking easy game. And on top of that, the level cap is no longer 200, it's now 999. So, at a certain point, you're probably just gonna hit the stat cap for every single stat anyway. But I did think it was worth mentioning. And speaking of augmentations, these are additional passive abilities that you unlock as you rank up each vocation. These are unlocked permanently and can be equipped on any class, and so this incentivizes you to max out every single one so you have access to the entire pool of augments. A lot of these are basically completely useless, like making your lantern cover a wider area. Wow! But then, there's quite a few other ones that are obviously useful, like reducing the amount of aggro that your character has, increasing your damage, increasing weak spot damage, increasing knockdown resistance, increasing knockdown power, so on and so forth. Again, the game's easy enough that you don't really need to min-max this, but assuming when the DLC that already leaked comes out, Capcom will actually add more difficult content and there'll be a real reason to max out every vocation. Now, something else that people complained about constantly in the original game is inventory weight, and unfortunately, it's the exact same system in the sequel. If anything, you actually start the game with less inventory load because a new collectible item, these golden trove beetles, are spread all across the map and they increase both your and your pawn's inventory maximum. But in the early game, it is insufferable how picking up just a handful of items puts you at the heavy inventory load, which not only slows your walking speed, but also increases your stamina usage and reduces your stamina regeneration. And it only gets worse once you get to very heavy and then over encumbered. Yes, your pawn can share the load with you, but if you make a small pawn, it can only carry about half as much as you can, so it's really not that big of a help. I'll be honest, I'm not that bothered by it at the end of the day. I think it's one of those unique quirks that kind of makes Dragon's Dogma what it is, but it no doubt will annoy some people. Another thing a lot of people are talking about is the reduced equipment slots. There's actually quite a bit of clothing customization in the original game because you actually had layered clothing. You had undershirts and underwear that you could give characters, and there was also a glove slot which has been removed. Again, this actually doesn't bother me all that much because being sort of on the more min-maxer side of things, I always just wore whatever my best armor was, but if you were big into the fashion souls element of the original, you're going to be a bit disappointed by the sequel. Everybody's going to end up looking the same, especially people's pawns, which are all dressed in slut clothing. And I can't believe I didn't talk about this until now, but I guess we could briefly talk about other players' pawns. This is a big fundamental part of the online component of this game, but much like you can create your own main pawn, you can recruit two of other people's pawns from online, and this is a pretty fun and innovative way to form your RPG party. Yes, it works exactly the same as the original, so there's not really much to talk about, but this is how you form your optimal party of a healer, a DPS, a tank, and either a second DPS or a second tank. There's no real option for a support class, because pawns can only be basic and advanced vocations, which only gives them six options, so it kind of limits their effectiveness in combat. But because the pawn AI is kind of stupid, maybe it's for the best that they're just limited to these simple roles where they only actually have to do a couple things. All I've noticed, really, is that sorcerer pawns are pretty fucking overpowered, especially only given the meteor skill. That's the only skill they'll ever use, and all it takes is one cast to pretty much win any fight. When other players use your pawn, once you rest at an inn, you're given a number of rift crystals, which I'm assuming is how long that they've traveled alongside the other player. Maybe it's based on combat performance, or at least how much EXP was accrued, I'm not really sure. And if another player really likes your pawn, they can give you an item and pretty much any item in the game. Now, of course, being a Z-list e-celeb, 
A couple of my fans decided to give me some really useful items like wake stones and port crystals, but don't expect to get any of that shit from other players. I purposely gave some players rotten food. That's a good way to tell somebody you didn't like their pawn. For now, the rift crystals aren't really that useful. You can use them to buy items to re-customize either your main character or your pawn. You can get incense, which changes your pawn's voice and how their AI functions in combat, and a few other things I honestly don't really care about. There's also a few features that are missing from this game that were in the first game that are just for convenience sake, and it's mainly to do with your storage and selling items. You used to be able to change out equipment directly from your storage when you changed classes, which saved you a hell of a lot of time. You can't do that anymore. You also can't sell items directly out of storage. And so you're going to be doing a lot of running back and forth between the vocation guild and the inn and the weapon and armor shops, all because of one missing feature that was in the first game. Again, it's just kind of a little thing, but it did add up, and I was highly annoyed every time I changed classes to get the footage for this review. Now, one last thing I do want to talk about that I couldn't really fit into any other section is the general NPCs in the world. And this is just an excuse for me to talk about being able to murder them. I don't know if it's just my inner teenage edgelord, but I love murdering NPCs in video games. It is one of the great joys in this world. It's why I love Postal 2 and why I tolerate Grand Theft Auto. And Dragon's Dogma is one of those rare fantasy RPGs that basically lets you kill anybody. Now, like I mentioned way earlier in this video, I recently learned you can't permakill NPCs, which kind of sucks, but they do stay dead for like two weeks. So, you know, if you see a character you don't like, maybe because of how they look, or their annoying voice, or maybe they just looked at you wrong, you can always just pick them up and throw them off of a cliff. And worry not, you'll have your coin back in good time, I promise you. <laughs> he didn't even hit the water. So I shall teach you a technique. Use it well. Now that you've taught me all your skills, you have no use to me! Come to claim my life. Yes. She knew it. She fucking knew, dude. But I shall go to the grave with a smile on my lips, for I have no regrets. Damn. The window's not open. As you can see, I have a very childish sense of humor, but it never gets old, dude. Unfortunately, throwing a non-hostile NPC in the water doesn't kill them, they just teleport back to where they were before. But yeah, enough fall damage or beating the shit out of them, and trust me, they have a lot of health, will get the job done. And if you accidentally soft-locked yourself out of a quest and can't afford to wait two weeks, you could always waste a wake stone to bring one of them back to life and you're good to go. I just wish the story had been designed around this mechanic so that you could still finish it even if you murdered basically everyone. You know, kind of like Fallout New Vegas. Because I really think this is a great feature in any game that it's in. Being able to kill NPCs is always fun and is legitimate player choice. People talk a lot about like, oh I want more choice in the game. Well to me, being able to kill NPCs is the absolute height of player choice. In an interactive medium like video games, determining the life and death of the citizens of this world and having to live with the consequences is one of the most meaningful choices you can make. Also, committing mass murder is fun. Okay, moving on to the character creation. Initially, when the character creator was released, I was incredibly disappointed with the female options, but it turns out that the underwear they force the characters to wear is just incredibly unflattering. One of you guys who's on my friends list made a pawn called Gina Coombs, or maybe Gina, who just straight up has the slam pig coomer body type. So thankfully, I didn't chicken out of shaving my head and I just didn't know you could make a coomer pawn, but I will say there's a lot of people disappointed that you can't make a character shorter than 160 centimeters. I have seen a theory that this is related to Australian censorship where you can't have sexual content with characters under 160 centimeters. However, there is no sexual content in this game really. The most you get is a scene with Wilhelmina where both characters have their shirt off. 
That's not really sexual content though. I find it far more likely Capcom did this because of ESG or internal ethics departments that were afraid of possible pedo allegations. In the original game, you could make a pawn I think even shorter than 140 centimeters. I played as a dwarf character before. And of course, there were plenty of people who made lolly pawns. Now you just can't do that anymore. Five foot two is the best you can do, which is like the average height of a woman in Japan. That's just kind of absurd. That's the shortest you can make a character in this game. Fortunately, you can still make a seven foot tall, jacked, Giga Chad type of character. I made a guy called Nappler, which is a fusion of Nappa and a funny mustache man I'm sure you've heard of. And I just love how goofy he looks. He's just a total cartoon lead henchman type of dude. It looks perfect. Honestly, wouldn't change a thing. But the female pawns, yeah, I don't know. I just wish the sliders were a bit more extreme. And I guess another issue is that the face customization is more limited than it seems because you have to pick a base face based on the face scans they took. And they only took face scans from average to ugly people. Not a single beautiful person was face scanned. And so you have to go to a lot of effort to make an attractive pawn yourself. But I'll still say at the end of the day, this is a pretty solid character creator. It's not quite as good as the first, just because of the limitations to making a, a dwarf or a short stack, or dare I say, a lolly. But I think with mods, it could certainly be better than the original. Despite the main story being pretty minimal, it's also completely nonsensical and feels unfinished. The basic premise is simple, when your hometown village is attacked by a massive dragon, your character rises to meet the challenge, and for his bravery, Grigori steals his heart, turning him into the Arisen. And so you must embark on a grand quest to defeat the dragon, and discover the true nature of the world. That part is exactly the same as the first game. After you're injured by Grigori, you are sold into slavery by the queen, so you can't claim your rightful place as the sovereign of the land. Yes, for some reason the Arisen are just automatically the kings of this world. It's not really explained, it's not how it worked in the first one. Instead, there is a false Arisen on the throne who is using a magical purple crystal made from the souls of older Arisen that can command pawns, which are a soulless golem legion of slaves. But normally only the Arisen can command pawns, and so when you wake up in this excavation site and see your slave owner commanding the pawns around, this, this was a pretty interesting opening for people who played the first game. But after a brief fight with the Medusa, with the help of a mysterious ghostly figure called the Pathfinder, you escape on the back of a friendly griffin, which is then shot down by your future wife Ulrika, and it collapses dead in the northern corner of the map. The soldiers nearby quickly discover that you are the true Arisen because the pawns find you and tell you that you're the Arisen and you're going to command them. And so now your duty is to challenge the throne and become the true ruler. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention, you have amnesia about becoming the Arisen. But you instantly get your memory back as soon as you get back to Melv. So the amnesia subplot was completely pointless. After this, you have to go on this game's equivalent of the Hydra Head Escort mission, where you go down a long, linear path, fight some goblins, a cyclops, and there's no way to skip this. Because unlike the first game, in New Game Plus, all of your port crystals are taken off the map and put back into your storage. So no, you can't skip this mission. You have to fucking walk down this linear path every time, but at least it's more fun than the Hydra Head Escort mission, thank God. Eventually we make our way to the capital and we have to do a bunch of busy work quests for the captain of the guard, a black guy who is the only guy who knows that you're the true king, or at least he's supposed to be. A bunch of other people just accept that you're the true Arisen, even though there's a king sitting on the throne right now who's supposed to be the Arisen. Whatever, don't ask too many questions. Clearly not that much thought was put into this plot. But after doing a bunch of busy work quests, including multiple stealth missions, and honestly, I don't even 
know why they pretend they're stealth missions. You can basically run right past the guards and be fine. You discover that the queen's son is actually a sympathizer for your cause and he wants to help you, but that doesn't go anywhere either. And after gathering sufficient evidence that the current ruler is not in fact the Arisen by finding out that he was actually going to be the leader of the thieves guild, he then demonstrates that he's the true king, quote unquote, by using the magic crystal to command the pawns. So all of that was a complete waste of time. And so now we need to travel to the Cat Kingdom to find out where these crystals came from. And we embark on this great journey across the sandbox. And let me talk about that for a bit. I honestly don't have that much to say about the sandbox, believe it or not. I already covered the main issues with it, that the enemy density is too high. I also think the map is a bit too big, given the low amount of worthwhile content. There's plenty of side quests, but the side quests suck. Very similar to the first game. The only ones really worth doing are the romance side quests and the ones to unlock the ultimate skills for each vocation. Now, some vocations don't even have a quest for the ultimate skill. In fact, you get the ultimate skill as you unlock the class, like with Magic Archer and Warfarer. But in the case of the romance side quests, I honestly don't care that much for either one. Ulrika is very basic and has not that much personality. She's basically in love with you ever since you tried to save the village and her, but she has to run away from her hometown of Melv for some reason that I honestly don't even remember. I'm not lying to you, I just did the quest and I forgot why the soldiers even wanted to arrest her in the first place. And so she takes up residence in a different town that's like halfway across the top part of the map. Oh yeah, get used to a lot of running back and forth in this game. It's no really wanted you to travel around on foot or use the ox cart fast travel system because fairy stones are 10,000 gold in this game. Yes, the fast travel item that is a consumable, there's no eternal fairy stone in this game unlike Dark Arisen. So you have to spend $10,000 every time you want to teleport across the map. Not to mention shops only sell one or two at a time. And so likely for a lot of these side quests, you're gonna be walking back and forth between towns fighting the same handful of enemy types to complete these quests. There's no fucking reason why I have to walk back and forth between quest objectives in different towns. Why did you do this? Regardless, at the end of this painful quest, you help her defend the little fishing village and her head leans on your shoulder or something. I honestly couldn't even see it past Nappler's insanely wide frame. And that's it, that's all you get. Yeah, sure, I left out some stuff in this quest, but trust me, you're not missing anything. It was a pain in the ass for very little reward. As for the other main romance option, Wilhelmina is the brothel owner in Vernsworth, the capital city, and her personal quest is a lot more interesting. She wants to assassinate one of the queen's inner circle who murdered both of her parents. Oh, and it turns out she's half Beastrin, by the way. Her mother, no less, so despite popping out of a cat person, she looks 99% human? All she has is one cat eye, that's it. Anyway, you help her in her murder revenge plot, which is actually not too terrible a quest by this game's standards, and then she sleeps with you. Pretty simple, at least she had a real motivation, and she actually has some character unlike Ulrika, but she also disappears from the game after this point. So that's kind of lame. As for the rest of the sandbox elements, to keep this brief, I'll say that it's still superior to the first games, just because there's actually things to find out in the open world. In the original game, the main quest took you to pretty much every interesting part of the map. In Dragon's Dogma 2, there's actually a reason to explore, and I'd say easily the biggest reason is the Sphinx. And like any good Sphinx, she gives you a series of riddles that you have to solve. Now, unfortunately, we have this little thing called the internet. And I know pretty much everyone, as soon as they get stumped, is just going to look up all the answers. I know I did. The riddles in question aren't just riddles. They're actually tasks that you have to complete, mini quests. And while some might seem borderline impossible or at least infuriating at first, like carrying a vase halfway across the map that can break in one hit, you can come up with creative solutions like simply kidnapping the person you're supposed to deliver it to and teleporting to the Sphinx. So yeah, I thought that was pretty fun. 
But I have to say, this is one small part of the game that really felt like it had a lot of effort put into it. A unique character, a boss no less, you can actually fight her and kill her, though it's a little bit difficult if you're underleveled. Unless you complete all of her riddles, in which case you can kill her in one hit with the arrow she gives you. But I thought the riddles were a really cool idea, they were decently creative. The first game is nothing like that at all, in fact I'd go so far as to say there is almost no reason to explore, at least before the post game in DD1. Another improvement is there's quite a few rare enemies located in caves or special locations, whether it's the Medusa from the beginning, or the new Skeleton Lord type enemy. You have your final showdown against the tumor covered dragon at the top of a mountain. It's very cinematic, if a bit easy. So I've heard some contrarians or liars or people with really bad memory claiming that the sandbox in this game is worse than the first and it's bullshit, complete and utter bullshit. The first game sandbox was one of the worst elements of the game, despite it being so small, it was an absolute slog because it was nearly empty. At least in this sandbox, there's stuff to do. Yes, there's too many enemies, but still, there's unique content, there's a real reason to explore. Alright, anyway, to get back to the story, eventually we make our way to the border, and unfortunately, the only people who can cross are Beastrin. And whatever you think about the furries, supposedly it's no one to put them in the first game, but due to time constraints he couldn't. And so now we have this complete other humanoid race, but they're not the only one. There's also dwarves and elves now, but they play almost no role in the story. The elves have a very small town and a couple quests, but the dwarves don't have any settlement. There's only like a handful across the entire game. Yet another unfinished part of the game. As for the Beastrin though, they get their own capital city, they're all spread throughout the desert part of the map. Their unique culture, if you can call it that, is being racist against both humans and pawns, though the humans are also racist back, so I guess it's only fair. But other than that, they are not really unique in any way. They even have the same exact accent as people from the rest of the world. As some people have pointed out, in Dragon's Dogma 1, Mercedes has a French accent. I'll have words sent for you, friend. Right, so you're in the capital a while. Julian has a German accent, at least I think it's supposed to be. Why am I speaking instead with a bleating she-goat mocked even by her own men? But in DD2, everyone has the same old world English accent. Which seems really lazy to me, but whatever, let's move on. So you can get past the border checkpoint by either wearing a Beastrin mask, playing a Beastrin, or you can simply walk around the border. I actually didn't know about that last one in the first playthrough. But either way, the Beastron Mask is easy to get your hands on. You cross over, you make a long journey through the desert, there's a huge level spike in the enemies here, so you might actually start getting your ass kicked again. Either way, now that we're at the cat capital, this is where the story derails completely. We find out the origin of the crystals is from this evil wizard called Phasis. And for some reason, we help his assistant find these little blue crystals on the coastline, and then we have to go see the old crazy beggar guy from the fishing village, who is a former dragon forged, which that's a whole thing I'm not going to bother explaining. Let's just say he knows the entire plot and nature of the world, and he basically just tells you. But I guess because it's from the mouth of a schizo crazy guy, you're totally not supposed to listen. That's not how video games work. He spoiled the fucking plot. And out from the sea rises these ruins of a huge castle, which I have been told is supposed to be Grand Soren, which I think is really cool. You'll notice when you travel in the tunnels under the map where you find the old Mad Sovereign, who's a cat person for some reason, it looks a lot like the Everfall, and he's sitting on the Seneschal throne from the first game. And this is where you learn that the nature of the world has changed. In the original game, after the player defeats Grigori, he has to usurp the Sovereign, who's sort of like a god, but really he's just a watcher of the world. His willpower is what holds the world together. But somewhere along the line, this changed. I think it's implied through this mad Sovereign, because this cat guy tried to take over everything and get to the real world. Now all of that sounds pretty interesting, but it doesn't actually go anywhere. 
but I guess the Watcher guy, the Pathfinder from the beginning, punished him for this by binding him to his throne for all of eternity. And so he gives you a withered version of the God's Bane Blade, the only thing that can kill a Seneschal, but because it's destroyed, you bring it to the evil wizard and let him fix it for you. That's kind of stupid, but I guess he just gives it back? But for some reason, then your quest says you need to bring it to Faces, the super evil wizard guy who we've been trying to stop the whole game. He's the guy behind the fake king and the queen taking power. Evil wizard guy, and we're just gonna give him the God's Bane Blade. What? They don't even explain this either. It's clear that a big chunk of the story was cut because it no longer makes sense from this point forward. So anyway, we make our way towards him, but a massive colossus rises from under the sea that is being controlled by giant forms of the crystal that can be used to control pawns. And so we get this cinematic boss battle, though it's really not a boss. It's like the Zora Magdaros fight from Monster Hunter World. Yeah, remember how everyone hated that? And the first time I played this game, I accidentally killed him nearly instantly with Magic Archer's broken ultimate skill. Yeah, it took out nearly every crystal on his body. And I actually got an achievement for ending the fight as soon as possible. So now we climb our way up the volcano where we get to this huge tower that looks a lot like Blue Moon Tower from the first game, which is also where we were enslaved at the beginning. And we find out they dug out the rest of the mines, it leads to this huge tower, and we get our big showdown with the wizard guy, which just involves taking out a bunch of his henchmen, including the fake king. The fake king just kind of fucking dies unceremoniously without a cutscene. And then Faces tries to summon and control the dragon so he can break the endless cycle of Arisens and dragons. Hey, wait a minute, are we sure he's the bad guy? Well, regardless, the plan fails. Grigori shows up. He asks you if you're ready for the final showdown with him. Yeah, this just fucking comes out of nowhere with no preparation. I mean, sure, the game tells you before this, get ready for the end, but this still came as a shock to me that the game just suddenly ends at this point. Oh yeah, and just like the first, Grigori has your beloved. To the amusement of all my audience, I didn't do any of the romance quests in my first playthroughs, so I fucking got stuck with Brant the Black Knight. Feel free to insert your jokes in the comments section. Well, it doesn't even matter anyway, there's no romance scene with your beloved in this game. Yeah, this game is just that fucking desexualized, even though it's really not. All you have to do is take one look at the pawns in the slut clothing all across the rift to see that people clearly still found a way to make this a Coomer game. And so then you have your big showdown with Grigori, which is way more lame than the first game. In the first game, it was fucking awesome. Like, it was a multi-phase boss battle. It's one of the only times in the game that was actually cinematic. Like, you have to run away from Grigori as he's smashing this narrow hallway. You hide behind rocks while he breathes fire on you. Then you have to run across these ruins of some other civilization as he's breathing fire down and it's crumbling behind you. Then you shoot a giant ballista bull at him, climb on his back, stab him in the heart. Then you fall through the air. It looks like he's about to swallow you whole and then you dodge out of the way. And then you have your epic fucking final showdown, which is so fucking cool. The dialogue's so good. The hour for turning back is past. The world will have its answer. You or me. Death or life beyond. If you would gain aught, give me a call and now. Such is the contest you have chosen. And then in the sequel, it has almost none of that. You just climb on his back and wait for him to stop talking, and then you have your showdown, and it's really, really similar to the first game. Again, this is a fucking remake, not a sequel. The boss fight is like the same fucking fight, just without any of the cool parts. And like I said earlier, I nearly killed him in one hit with Magic Archer after downing him. It was nuts. And so, after defeating the dragon, you claim your rightful spot on the throne because the false king died, and you can be forgiven for forgetting that immediately. There's no struggle from the queen or her son, but 
This is a bad ending if you let it go through. As you'll notice, the Pathfinder is here at your coronation ceremony. He implies that you are greedy for even more power, just like the Mad Sovereign. And so he takes you back in time to right before you fight in Grigori, and you have to climb onto his belly near where your heart is inside of him, and stab yourself with the God's Bane blade. This leads to Grigori dying, and you falling into the brine, being taken into some shadow realm of sorts, and it plays out a similar scene to the first game where illusions of your companions from throughout the game appear in front of you. Unfortunately, you don't get to kill them. I thought it was pretty awesome you got to kill all the notable characters from the first game. And there's also only three here because there's so few memorable characters that there's only three characters that appear in the new scene. The Pathfinder decides to show you what a world looks like without the eternal struggle between the Arisen and the Dragon. And this is the coolest part of the game. This was legit Kino. I mean, just look at the fucking red swirling clouds, the giant sky beams, like it's a fucking superhero movie, and the world is slowly being consumed by a red fog. And all of the water has evaporated, so you know this world is fucked. And there's an actual time limit. If you rest at an inn and you don't take out the sky beams, the world is slowly consumed by the fog. And so you're given just a couple more main quests before the end. You get to rescue your pawn, and then there's an optional quest where your pawn takes over the Colossus and fights one of the giant fat snakes and that fights off the fog for a while. You can take out the sky beams, which have special boss fights, though the snake is a complete joke, like I said earlier. The dragon fight's not too bad, though. And then your final quest is to evacuate each of the kingdoms to the ruins of Grand Sorin. And this felt like fucking busy work right at the end. Just one final boring ass fetch quest to almost ruin a really cool moment. Now, of course, this is technically completely optional. You can rest at the seafloor shrine and just go straight to the end. But obviously, you're going to want to rescue the kingdoms and it unlocks shops and a bunch of NPCs at the seafloor. So you're probably not going to skip it. Let's be honest. As for the post-game world itself, just like the original game, it adds a bunch of super dangerous monsters. You can fight multiple Doolahans across the map. There's Gore Chimeras, which are just a stronger version of Chimeras. This is where I got stunlocked to death multiple times as warrior because the fighter enemies just overwhelm your pawns, kill them, and when it's you versus 10 enemies, you're gonna lose pretty much every time unless you're playing Thief. Regardless, despite it looking very cool, I still think this is a bit of a downgrade from the Everfall because the whole point of the Everfall was to be a sort of boss rush and it let you fight enemies that I'm assuming for lack of development time, they couldn't fit in the game world itself, right? This is where the Beholder would show up. I actually don't remember what it's really called, but it's straight up a Beholder from D&D was in the first game. And also a white version of the Hydra. You could fight Drakes. You could fight multiple bosses at the same time. It was just a great post-game dungeon that made the best of the game's combat system because the most fun part of the game was fighting the giant monsters, obviously. Unfortunately, in this post-game, you have to run across vast, empty landscapes, these narrow pathways where the ocean used to be, to make your way to the boss fights. So yeah, it's certainly not bad, and you can eliminate the time limit by taking out the sky beams, but I still think it's just not as effective as the first game's post-game. And so now that we're ready to go to the end, you think you're going to get a final, final boss because you're riding on the back of a Super Grigori that I guess the Pathfinder took the form of. But it's just a fucking glorified walking simulator quick time event. I'm not joking, dude. All you do is crawl across his back, run away from like fire and the brine and shit. And then your pawn, who has turned into a shadow dragon for some reason, by the way, has now gained an independent will, which is very similar to what happens in the first game. And so using her small willpower helps you defeat the giant dragon in a cutscene, freeing this world from fate which is very similar to Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning, if you played that. And then, during the credits, you get to see how all of the important characters are doing in very brief scenes, and for seemingly no reason, you then go into New Game Plus. This is actually the one scenario where New Game Plus doesn't make sense. In the original game, how the game ended, 
was you got tired of sitting on the throne of being God, essentially, right? So you stab yourself with the God's Bane blade, and then your pawn falls back to your hometown, Cassardus, but it turns into you. This is why I told some people that you should never make a Coomer pawn in the first Dragon's Dogma, because she's just going to turn into you and then cuck you with your lover. But none of that is in this game. You just freed this world from the eternal cycle. So I guess New Game Plus just exists here so that you can keep playing the game with the same character, but theoretically this would end the eternal cycle. And I do like that better than Japan's obsession with literal interpretations of history repeating itself or time being a flat circle, whatever saying you want to go with. And I think it's just kind of lazy to have things never change. But still, as you could probably tell from this synopsis, this story is nonsensical, it's incredibly short. If you skipped all the optional content, you could probably beat it in like 15 hours. And somehow it's worse than the first games, despite the first game's story not being good either. But honestly, I think more importantly, it's just forgettable. There's not nearly as many memorable characters. The first game had all the various waifus, whether it's Mercedes, the Casca clone, Madeline, the greedy blonde bitch with big titties, Celine, the lolly goth girl, Eleanor, the duchess who turns out to be a total bitch and gets you flayed in prison. I'll never forget that. And then of course you have the goofy characters like Festy who puts the stupid fucking party hat on your head when the Duke meets you. The Duke himself is a fairly memorable character. Mason, a black character who actually has an explanation why he exists and despite being a scoundrel is actually a good guy. And honestly, I could name even more than that, but I know there's people out there who will say, what the fuck are you talking about? I don't remember any of those characters. Haven't played the game in 10 years. And look, I get it. I'm not going to pretend that Dragon's Dogma has a good story or a good character roster, but it had a unique vibe. It felt very Japanese in the best way possible. Outside of the monster designs, you can't really tell that Dragon's Dogma is supposed to be an homage to D&D. It doesn't really feel like it. And that's because it had its own unique flavor. A lot of that flavor has been lost with this sequel slash remake. The world has lost a lot of its believability and authenticity as well, with the requirement of dark-skinned NPCs in every single town. What's the point of having this Beastrin people with their own capital if every race lives there? In fact, only Beastrin are supposed to be able to cross the border checkpoint. Why are there so many humans here? Believe it or not, the elf village is all elves. I was pretty shocked to see that, but everywhere else is pretty fucking diverse. I wouldn't go so far to say that it's soulless, but it's clear that a lot of the identity of the original game has been ironed out. The characters aren't memorable, the story's a fucking hot mess, the sandbox is really only marginally better than the first game. So once again, you're really only playing this for the combat. I could continue to ramble on about this, but let's just get to the conclusion. Should you buy Dragon's Dogma 2? Only when it's on sale. This is the first time I've said in quite a long time in a conclusion that technically, yes, this is a good game. It's a fun game, but you absolutely should not buy this at full price for the numerous flaws I have named throughout this review. Whether it's the various controversies about the performance problems or the microtransactions or the diversity or the horrible enemy variety or the terrible story, the lack of memorable characters, and blatantly unfinished. This game, just like the first, feels blatantly unfinished. I don't know how that's possible. It's no lied to all of us saying that this is his realized vision of the first game. There's no way in hell that's true. The theory is that he got fucked over by Capcom because this had to release in the 2023 fiscal year, and March is the end of that year, so the game was rushed out. It probably got fucked over during development by COVID like basically every other game did, and so, just like the first game, it got released in an unfinished state. The problem is, the higher budget and resources were devoted to all the wrong places. I don't really care if the sandbox is better in this game than the first. 
I just played the first game as like a more casual, over-the-top version of Monster Hunter. You fight giant monsters, you climb on their back, you stab them in the face, and you rinse and repeat over and over again. The only real challenge was Bitter Black Isle, which is everyone's favorite part of the first game, and it's not in this one. And I don't care if you say, oh well, Bitter Black Isle wasn't in the original release. Who cares? I expect a sequel to improve on all of the aspects of the previous game, or at the very least be side grades. Dragon's Dogma 1 was infamous for being the greatest 7 out of 10 game of all time, where the combat system was fun as hell and everything else about that game was shit. Now sure, that's a bit of an exaggeration. I actually did enjoy the characters from that game, even if the story itself was pretty minimal. It had a lot of memorable moments. I think Grigori is one of the greatest dragons in video game history, and the final showdown against him is probably the greatest dragon boss in any game. But almost everything else was forgettable at best. With Dragon's Dogma 2, it basically feels like a remake, because all the same flaws with the original are in this one. The problem is, a lot of them are worse. Shit, there's so many issues with this game, it's crazy. So the question is, well, why the hell would I recommend it then? It just sounds mid. Well, here's the thing. I still think this is a pretty solid, but extremely flawed game. I had a lot of fun still with the combat system, even if I don't like some of the tweaks to it. There were plenty of moments I was smiling throughout the streams, whether it's because a harpy threw me off the cliff, or I get a cool cinematic finish on a boss, like uppercutting an ogre in his glass jaw, or using the charged up mystic spear hand move to blast a chimera in the face. Even just the ragdoll physics they added to Cyclops is incredibly amusing. And of course, being a bit of an edgelord, tossing all of the NPCs I don't like off of a cliff. I'm a bit disappointed you can't actually perma-kill them, but any game that lets you kill named NPCs is fun in my book. So there's still a lot of fun to be had here, it's just in between a lot of garbage. My biggest problem with this game is that it doesn't feel like a sequel, it feels like a remake. And like many other modern remakes, it's partially a demake. I would compare this to the Resident Evil 4 remake, where I still had a lot of fun with the game, but I definitely don't like it as much as the original. The shift in focus to the sandbox instead of the core gameplay experience feels like something made to appeal to normies or casual gamers or whatever you want to call them, instead of fans of the original. This game should have way more giant monsters to fight, it should have more basic enemy variety, it should have more vocations than the first game. No Warfarer doesn't fucking count. It feels like 90% of the budget in this game went into making this a from the ground remake of the first game in a new engine, and by the time they accomplished that, there was no time left to actually expand on the previous one. The only huge improvement I will give Dragon's Dogma 2 over the first one is that it is more consistently entertaining. Dragon's Dogma 1 had higher highs and lower lows, but at least this game is consistently fun, even if it never quite hits the heights of the first game. There's no ultra-long Hydra Head escort mission that caused everyone to quit. Some people even quit shortly afterward, because the game just doesn't really pick up until you fight the Griffin. DD2 rectifies that mistake by giving you a little bit more freedom. You can wander around, fight ogres, cyclopses, griffins, all sorts of enemies appear in the first part of the map. A lot of the story quests still kind of suck dick, but at least they don't require you to walk around huge empty wastelands to get there. However, a lot of the side quests absolutely do. I could easily continue to ramble about how many upgrades and downgrades there are, but Ultimately, the first game is the more fun game, and it has an actual end game. Bitter Black Isle was something to keep playing the game for. This one, after you've completed the game twice, you've seen everything there is to see. There's no reason to keep playing. I'll leave you with that. I'll see you next time, guys. I will purify this land. No disgusting old incest people. <laughs> Fucking humans. <laughs> that scream, dude. Oh, she's punching me. She's punching me. I don't know what the fuck you're gonna do against a seven foot tall dude with a mace. With a giant fucking mace. <laughs>